The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted many facets of our household economy. Consumers faced with real decisions between paying for their rent, paying for their mortgage, or credit card bills. As we build back better, how can consumers tackle issues of credit and debt? This year, during National Consumer Protection Week, our Office of Consumer Protection is highlighting how you can build, maintain, and improve your credit, how credit scores are determined, how to deal with debt collectors, and how to avoid debt workout schemes. Thank you, Tracy, and our entire team for keeping our community safe and informed. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this evening's webinar on debt collection credit and your credit score. We thank the county executive for introducing us in. I'm Rosa Miami. I'm a volunteer member of the Howard County, Maryland Consumer Protection Advisory Board. Uh, as a member of the board, we work with the Office of Consumer Protection to educate and protect Howard County consumers. Uh, board members provide feedback on, and recommendation on um, the Consumer Protection Office uh, programs. Uh, we talk about, uh, let them know about problems and concerns we witness in the community and, and help in educating county residents. And this is one of those ways through our webinars. This webinar is being recorded and a couple of other housekeeping notes. Um, if you have questions during the session, uh, put them in the chat. Uh, you'll see something at the bottom, hopefully, of your screen, depending on how your screen is configured. Uh, it is uh, at the bottom over, at least on mine, it's over on the uh, right side of the screen at the bottom. And then we're going to take your questions at the end of the presentation. So I want to introduce the new administrator for the Office of Consumer Protection. Uh, Tracy Resvani, uh, and she's going to talk a little bit about what to look out for. And again, uh, go ahead and put your questions in the chat as you have them. I'll be monitoring that uh, as Tracy speaks, and then we'll get to you at the end of the presentation. So, Tracy, why don't you take it away? Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me share the uh, presentation. And um, so one thing, if during the presentation you have a clarifying question, maybe you didn't hear or didn't understand anything I said, I'll try to pause after every slide um, to answer those quick questions, but substantive questions uh, would be better left for the end. And since this is a recorded program, um, please make them general. For specific questions, feel free to contact us tomorrow or anytime uh, during the business day. In fact, you can pop by um, if you have records and you want us to look through it, you can uh, definitely come by and visit us in person as well. So what do we do? The Office of Consumer Protection, for those who have not used our service, we handle disputes between merchants and consumers and between landlords and tenants. Um, we like to say that if you spent money and you're not happy with the end result, with limited exceptions, you can come to us. And the main exceptions are anything that sounds like malpractice, or anything that has some kind of an insurance component to it. Um, we provide um, consumer specialists by phone or email or in person, as I mentioned. So if you don't know what your rights are, if you don't know, hey, can they do that or can I do that? Um, like I said, get in touch with us, um, we're here for you. Um, we are a law enforcement agency. So we do also um, handle uh, the consumer. We also enforce the consumer protection laws in the county. So if in the course of looking at a complaint that someone's filed, we find that there's been a violation of the law, we can take enforcement action. We do a lot of programs um, in person or by webinar to the community. Um, so if you are a civic group, a community group, a business group, uh, a faith-based group, what have you, feel free to reach out to us if you'd like to have us come and present. Uh, lastly, we do license and regulate certain businesses. So we, um, if your car unfortunately gets towed, um, we are the body that licenses them. And uh, we also do provide the license to peddlers and solicitors who come into the county um, and come to your home, for example. So we're gonna quickly do a quick overview of what credit is in case we have some younger viewers. Uh, credit scores, credit reports, 
then we'll get into the nitty gritty of debt collection, lawsuits, what to do, and then what kind of scams are out there and what you can do to avoid them. Um, so real quick, what is credit? And this is important because whether something is credit is going to come up um, throughout this presentation. And that's basically the notion that you're using someone else's money to be able to immediately access a good or a service with the understanding that you will pay it back later. Um, and so the credit, the amount of credit is based on the lender's confidence, the credit score, that you can be trusted to pay back what you borrowed along with any finance charges, that cost of the credit. Now, remember, if, if you have what I call these hybrid cards, where it's an old, it used to be called an ATM card, but it's this debit card that has a Visa MasterCard logo. Those are not credit cards. So they are not um, going to be uh, building your credit. They're not going to comply or need to comply with credit laws. And so they won't help you build or maintain or improve your credit when you're using those hybrid cards. And this is gonna come in um, throughout this program. So what kinds of credit are there? Obviously you've got the revolving credits with the minimum payment due and the limit. You've got charge cards. Those are the originally the American Express cards were true charge cards. You have to pay it off at the end of the month, no matter what you charged on it. Um, you've got service credit. Those are like the gyms or the cell companies or you know cable or utilities where um, you're getting a monthly, you sign a contract and you're buying a phone with the understanding that you're going to use the service for a certain amount of time and make your payments on time. And then there's those installment loans. A lot of times you'll get them at the furniture store. Like if you're going to buy furniture, you'll get into some kind of an installment loan, usually with Synchrony Bank, for example. It's a closed end, there's a repayment plan, it's a specific sum. So quick pros and cons. The pros, obviously, you can buy the items now. You don't need to have the cash, it's convenient. It helps establish credit. It's a bit circular that credit establishes credit, but it's true. And it also gives you a record of your purchases. The drawbacks are obviously the cost of credit, the interest charges, any fees, those annual fees, late fees. Um, if you're still paying any, um, you know, there's there's all kinds of these fees that get hidden into these um, products. So those are a cost. Impulse buy, right? If you don't have to have the cash, you're more likely to spend money on things that you may not need or, uh, you know, really, really have to buy right away. Um, and you have to then track all your expenses to make sure that you're not overspending. So that's another con. And if you don't pay when um, you're expected to, then there's obviously a collection activity or um, lawsuits as well. So early wage access. So this becomes one of the first items where is this credit comes up. So we're seeing a lot of this happening out there where it's an employer's providing this benefit. Um, it's a subscription. Sometimes it's a monthly fee you pay, might have some guardrails on it. You're able to dip into your paycheck early. The money comes out of your next paycheck. So employers consider this to be a good benefit for employee retention. Detractors say, well, now you as an employee are captive because you're now forever indebted to your employer, right? Um, Earnin, Branch, Daily Pay, those are some of these uh, companies that are providing these early, um, uh, early access uh, of your wages. And um, like I said, the money's coming directly out of your bank account, so you don't even have the choice of, do I pay all of it back? Do I pay a minimum payment? It's all coming back under the plan. Is this really credit? So obviously the earn-in branch, the employers say no. But if you go back to the original definition, you the question is, is this your money or is this your employer's money. So at the time you're getting access to it, you can see the argument could go both ways. However, the fee that you pay, once it gets analyzed, you realize that it is translating to triple digit interest rates, right? So if this is in credit, then you're also not 
building credit for using it. So that's another problem. And if it's not credit, you don't get any TILA protections. You don't get any protections under Reg Z. There's no ability to refinance. There's no ability to renegotiate. So what is this? This is going to be an issue that um, it was probably going to get a lot of court treatment coming up. Um, I saw a hand get raised and um, if there's a question, that would be best um, if, if you could type your question in and then if it's a clarifying question, Rosa can stop me and I can ans ask the answer the question. So the other topic that comes in is these buy now, pay later. Um, you've probably seen it on Amazon a lot. A lot of the online retailers are getting into this. It's this weird mix between the old layaway and credit. So you wanna buy something, they're gonna divide it up into these four uh, easy payments. And you know, Klarna is, is a big one, Afterpay is another one you've probably seen, but uh, the picture on the slide shows you a lot of the different brands. There's no credit check. The payments come directly out of your bank account. So it kind of sounds like that early wage access, but one in five will miss a payment. And because the money's coming directly out of your bank account, one in three overdraft on their bank accounts. And so there's these high NSF fees that are charged by banks and by the buy now, pay later providers. So those, it sort of goes back to the cost of the cons of credit. Are you buying something that you really can't afford? And is this now setting you back? Because if you don't make that payment on time, or if you get overdrafted, now you're causing problems with your other creditors. Um, so is this an alternative to high cost of credit? Or is this an enticement to spend when you're not really able? That's a good debate that we can have. Um, I just read an article today that uh, PayPal has become, <coughs> excuse me, this shadow student debt market because now these buy now pay laters are cropping up in for-profit institutions. So that's something we'll be keeping an eye on. Um, was there a question that popped up or no? There, there is, it looks like uh, questions about, I guess, jargon. So Reg Z asking what that is, okay. TILA, okay. yeah. Yeah, um, we're going to talk a little bit further about it, but I can um, talk about it. So the Truth in Lending Act, so if you've ever taken out a car loan or any kind of loan, you get all those disclosures of what the amount you're financing, what the interest rate is, what the payment is at the end of the you know, four years, or if you're buying a house, the 30 years, all of that comes under the Truth in Lending Act. And Regulation Z is the one that gives you the right to challenge any or dispute anything on your credit card and that it limits your um, liability to $50. That applies to credit cards. And if you remember at the top of this program, I said those hybrid cards, those debit cards with Visa MasterCard, those don't fall under TILA. They don't fall under Reg Z because they're not credit cards. They fall under a completely different regulation, completely different protections. And so just the complete, just the, go to the side a little bit. If you're shopping online, don't use those debit cards because you have significantly less protections. I'll be talking more about that at our Thursday night program about electronic payments. So if you haven't registered for that, um, I'll be talking a lot more about that on Thursday night. So coming back, so talking about credit. So you now have credit. What are the ways you can protect it? Um, you can freeze it. You can lock it or you can put on a fraud alert. And so each of these are different. Um, a fraud alert is when you are basically telling your um, credit reporting agencies, hey, I think I need to have heightened protections on my credit. It's free. It forces any new credit to go through additional hurdles but it's not impossible for you or an identity thief to be able to get credit under a fraud alert. Um, so it just requires a few more hurdles to make sure you're you. A credit freeze, as, as the name says, complete freeze. No one can use your credit, including you. Again, it's free. 
You can put uh, freezes on your minor child's credit or the credit of any adult that you have guardianship over. Um, so you need a pin to lock and unlock it. Both fraud alerts and credit freezes are protected by federal law. And so you have specific rights and credit reporting agencies have specific obligations under those laws. When Congress made these items free, credit reporting agencies decided to create this thing called a credit lock. And it's basically like an app. You can lock and unlock your credit. It costs money significantly more than the $5 that freezes used to call a uh, cost. There's no legal protections except for what's buried in the terms of service. And if you've had any opportunity to be able to sit down for a few days to read it, you'll probably realize it doesn't really give you much anyway. It's unclear who is liable if things get through. So I personally do not um, think credit locks are a great idea, um, but it is supposedly instantaneous. Whereas with a credit freeze, you need to give your credit a couple of days to unfreeze once you trigger the pin to lock it or unlock it. So myths versus facts. Um, Myth is that credit reports have credit scores. They don't. Uh, credit scores um, are something that is completely different. Uh, credit reports that are processed by FICO or FICO or Vantage, um, they are the ones that create the scores. Um, checking your score does not drop it. Um, applying for credit will five points, about five points at a time. And these are all FICO. Um, I'm giving you information based on the FICO brand of credit score. Um, and we'll be talking about FICO a lot today, but Vantage is the other brand. There's, um, and so they all have different ways of calculating your credit score. And we'll also talk about how there's different kinds of FICO scores. So a car lender will have a different uh, FICO report than if you're getting a mortgage or if you're buying furniture. So every type of creditor has a completely different algorithm that FICO or Vantage runs. Um, carrying a small balance is not better off than paying the whole balance off. A credit reporting agency does not know how much you are paying. Um, they only know what balances you're carrying and whether you're making the payments on time. Uh, closing unused cards may or may not help. And that really depends on your credit utilization. And we'll talk about that as well. So these are sort of setting up a lot of the nuts and bolts that we're going to be talking about next. So credit scores. This is information about you. The bill payment history, what kind of accounts you have, have there been collection actions, any outstanding de debt. Um, the points are awarded based on this algorithm, this calculation that predicts how likely you are to make the payments and make them on time. That's your credit worthiness. Um, there's a new FICO 10T. Remember I said there was many kinds of FICO scores. There's like a FICO 3 and a FICO 8. There's a new 10T that incorporates this trended data. So it looks at the consumer's account balances and payment activity on loans and credit cards going back about two years. Um, there's hard inquiries and soft inquiries. And so it's really the hard inquiries that potentially impact your credit. Soft inquiries are the ones that maybe if you go into a car dealership and they're just trying to get a sense of what your buying power is, that's a soft inquiry. Or if someone, a bank is trying to give you a prepaid credit card, that's a soft inquiry. Um, that looks at household income, employment, zip code, and uh, NSF fees, those are not considered. And, you know, there's a lot of um, question as to whether this statement is true. I will be very honest, but FICO maintains they do not consider household income, employment, zip code, or um, your NSF uh, information. When you're going out and you know getting this Credit Karma app, um, know that that doesn't use FICO. And if for some reason you're working with a lender that needs FICO, Credit Karma is not gonna give you the FICO score. 
TransUnion also doesn't give you your FICO score. Um, but again, some creditors want Vantage, some want FICO. I just have information from FICO and that gives you enough to be able to extrapolate onto Vantage. Um, if for some reason you absolutely need a FICO branded score, Experian and the Discovery Scorecard, Discover Scorecard <laughs> provides that um, FICO score for you. So what goes into the credit score? Um, as you can see, most of it is payment history, a huge chunk of it and the amount owed, right? So how much debt have you racked up? How good are you about making payments on time? Type of credit use, that's sort of the mix of credit, mortgage, auto loan, installment loan, that's a big piece. How long of a credit history do you have? Are you new at credit or have you been doing this for 20, 30 years? And then last but not least, how much new credit are you amassing? Because that also triggers a concern that perhaps you're about to um, increase a lot of your debt, and that can make your uh, potential creditors a little nervous. So, as I mentioned, FICO says that they consider trade lines, and we'll talk about what that is, inquiries, collections, and what's in the public record. Um, they maintain that their algorithms do not use age, address, employment, income, race, or gender. Um, and I have no reason to doubt that Vantage will make the same um, statement uh, if asked. So this is a sample credit report um, that FICO used at a webinar that I went to, which is why I'm using so much of their information. So zones th two through five are the ones that we're going to get into a little more detail about. Um, so obviously, on a, your, when you get the credit report, the top part identifies you, and then we're going to get into the uh, main zones of information. Public records. There is no positive public record that you can have because what they're looking for are judgments, bankruptcies, tax liens. So they're not looking to see if you got a, you know, if you've got a ticket for speeding, thank goodness. And they're not going to be looking for anything like that. But really, if you're if you're triggering the public record search, it's because of these three types of uh, entries. Uh, trade lines are um, basically gives you the history of your payments. So in this sample payment, this person, John Smith, um, was on time except for January of 2011 when he was 30 days late. So trade lines will show okay, they might show charged off, settled, or they'll show delinquencies as 30, 60, or 90, and that correlates to number of days. So that's the other area. Um, so trade narratives, as you can see in the sample, you can see where um, we have, uh, I've got the arrow that shows where the trade narratives are. And so those are the additional information that, um, that John Smith is providing, or they're providing on John Smith. So that would be where your charge offs are noted, your foreclosures, any kind of forfeiture, repos, um, voluntary repos, any charge offs, bankruptcies, you name it. They're going to be in the comment section. This is where the credit reporting agency is providing more information to a prospective creditor and to you when you pull your credit report to make sure it's it's perfectly uh, accurate. What has happened on this particular entry, this particular trade um, that he had with some bank in Wilmington, Delaware. And above the comments, you'll see status, and that's the next area and that will talk about what is the status of that debt did you voluntarily self surrender it is it in collection but paid in full did it go to repo is there a forfeiture of the deed is it still late so the account status gives the status of that particular trade so you've got the trade line that tells you what the if you're 30 days late then you have the additional to go back then you'll have the additional narrative and then the status. So you'll get all of the information per creditor on your credit report. So creating, maintaining, or improving your credit, obviously uh, if you're starting out, 
what do you do? You already established how do you make it better? Um, so you need to have one reported open and undisputed account. Six months is usually a good history. Um, we always say get a gas card, you can go to Macy's or somewhere, just establish a simple card. Low balance is good enough. You want to create that and follow a budget. You want to make sure you never exceed the credit limit. You always want to pay on time, avoid late fees, and then you want to limit the number of credit cards. And then um, we're going to talk a little bit about the debt to credit ratio. Um, so if you say you have 10 cards at a hundred dollar limit a piece, and if you have one that is maxed out and the rest is open, does that look better to a creditor than if you have $10 on 10 of the cards? So when you are looking at your uh, credit ratio, you always wanna make sure that the amount of debt versus the amount of available credit is always leaning towards a better credit area. So they have more available credit than debt. So that if you end up closing eight of those credit cards, remember you had only one that was maxed at 100 and then you had 900 that was open. If you were to close eight of those, you would go from a 10% debt to credit ratio to a 50%. And so that's when uh, earlier I said closing unused credit cards might help or they might not this is where it comes um, into play. So if you have a lot of credit cards that you're not using and you're inclined to close them, that's fine because it kind of lowers your risk of maybe getting lost or having an identity thief get a hold of it. But always make sure that when you're doing that, the amount of debt you're carrying doesn't become a higher percentage of your overall credit. Um, and as I said, get your credit report. You get a free one every year look through it, make sure everything's correct, challenge what's not uh, correct, and clear that up. And that will always help to um, improve your credit. So say you end up looking at your credit report and you see that there's something wrong. So you definitely wanna report that and challenge that with the credit reporting agencies. You want to make sure that you're keeping your good accounts in um, in good standing. Um, if you are in a situation where things are in arrears, um, the, be proactive because a lender would much more rather work with you to come up with a payoff amount than sell it for pennies on a dollar to a debt collector and have them collect their money instead. So definitely reach out to your creditors early and see if you can work out some kind of a payment plan. Talk to a credit counselor, but never, ever, ever pay upfront for their services. Um, beware that cr uh, these credit repair companies out there can be um, scams as much as anything else. And uh, you want to make sure that you are protecting your money, especially if you're in this situation. So how do you hurt your credit? Not checking your credit report and maybe failing to see errors. Um, not having any credit cards. I mean, I totally understand those who like to work with their hybrid cards and just live off of their bank accounts because it's fiscally responsible. It absolutely is. Um, however, it doesn't build your credit. Um, asking for a credit limit increase just to have increased credit, that could be a problem. Um, consolidating all your debt into one credit card, especially if you're then gonna close out all of your other cards, that could cause problems with your credit ratio. Um, oddly enough, paying off all your debt at once could have some kind of repercussions. Um, make sure that, you know, sometimes divorces don't pay off or the joint accounts or you end up co-signing on a relative and then they're late on a debt. Um, so unpaid parking tickets show up, uh, overdue library fines could show up. Medical debt, um, 
that could end up causing a lot of problems with your credit card. Um, and, you know, you want to make sure that that's not showing up on your credit report, especially if you've been a victim of identity theft. And so um, you want to think about that as well. So that's something else you want to make sure you're looking at on your credit report. Um, so renting a car using your debit card and then having it there be in some kind of a car accident or some a problem. We've seen some instances where that's locked up money. So then you're in a situation where you're not able to make um, payments. And so on a credit card, you're, you know, you've got some protections that you may not be able to get on your debit card. So again, remember I said when you're thinking about what card to use, you know, going to debit may seem like a fiscally responsible, but you always have to think um, a little further ahead and think about, well, what protections am I getting with this card versus that card? So minimum balance, the minimum payments, um, those are not there for your benefit. They are there for the lender's benefit. That's what they're saying is the minimum that they want, um, but it's not necessarily in your best interest. Um, but you always want to make sure you make at least that minimum payment for your credit and your credit score. And so this is a very wordy slide, and but I thought it was really, really important to see how that minimum amount is typically calculated. So it, it's it's calculated using the greater of a said dollar amount, usually $35, maybe $45 or a percentage of the balance plus interest and late fees. And so making your minimum payments adds to your debt significantly. And so in this example, we took a $6,200 uh, balance with a 16% uh, interest rate. Using that minimum payment calculation, it would take over 17 years to pay off $6,200. And with the interest, you'd really be paying about um, $13,500. So this gives you an idea of while sometimes you have no choice but to make a minimum payment because times are tough, if you can make more, absolutely you should do so. So how long do things stay on your credit? And that's a question that we get a lot. Um, first of all, I'm going to keep saying this, check your credit report. There's reports out there that about 30% of them have errors on them. And so you want to make sure you clean them up. And sometimes you'll see that things are on your credit report longer than they should be. Um, so each state has its own laws about how long things can stay on there. So if you are watching from another state or if you have friends and family who are you know, talking to you about this, they want to make sure to check their laws as well. Um, so typically, late payments can stay on for seven years. Accounts going to collections can be seven years. Bankruptcies could be ten years, um, or you know anywhere between seven or ten years. Good standing accounts in good standing, thankfully, can stay on there indefinitely. Um, and so, you know, it depends on what kind of uh, information we're talking about. But you know, hard inquiries, as you can see, um, they, they could be on there for two years. So lawsuits and court judgments, that's really going to be a function of um, whether it hits the public record, if it's not something that ends up as a public record. And so that's a little bit harder for me to be able to say this is how long they typically are. And the time frame starts from the first delinquency. Um, but, you know, and if something goes into collections, it can stay on there for an extra 180 days, um, even after you've paid it off. And, and so there's this lag to providing updated status information. Even. So let's say you've done everything you can um, and, you know, you you're think you're going to go end up in collections. What can you do? Get organized. Find all of your agreements, all those cardholder agreements, your mortgage agreements, your installment loan agreements, get your payment records, um, get your statements. And if you've got a bankruptcy discharge, you definitely want to grab that. 
And by all means, you want to avoid collection. So you contact your lender and say, hey, I've got a history of making payments. Here's all of my payment records. I fell on hard times. I want a payment plan. And like I said, they would much rather have you pay them 80 cents on the dollar than sell to a debt buyer or a debt collector at 3 cents on the dollar. Um, we, and by we, I mean, I like to recommend um, these two organizations, uh, Cash Campaign of Maryland and CCCSMD, which um, they're great organizations, they're nonprofits. Start with them. They're really good about being credit counselors or financial coaches. And so they're a good place to start. If you're not local, the National Foundation for Credit Counseling is a good place to start to get a trustworthy referral. So nonprofit versus for-profit organizations. The two companies I gave you, they're nonprofits. Not saying that for-profit organizations are bad, but you definitely want to research the consumer experience. Um, debt settlements are when you are paying money to a third party instead of your creditor, who then negotiates on your behalf um, with that money. So this money gets tied up for months while this third party is holding on to the money and negotiating. Um, you know, it can still impact your credit score. Remember when we about five or eight slides back, that settlement was a, um, a trade line, uh, which information that would be available. Um, the settlements stay on your credit still. And um, but keep in mind, in Maryland, they should not be charging you a fee until they have delivered on their promise. Um, so credit and legal counsel, which lawyers, they can help, but you have to make sure you're getting to a good, solid, trustworthy um, counselor um, or provider. Debt consolidation is where you are borrowing money to pay all of this debt in one lump sum. And you can sometimes work with a credit counselor to negotiate the amounts overall. Um, a lot of folks might use a HELOC or some sort of a second mortgage instrument to do a debt consolidation. But before you go down to that road, you have to make changes in your spending habits. You have to make a budget to make sh and make sure you don't make adjustments to that. Um, so that you don't end up having this huge balloon of debt while you run up additional debt on the side. Um, you can also discuss about how you can lower your payments before you get into this debt consolidation situation. Um, and maybe you can get one of these like interest-free uh, transfers that sometimes cards have, but they have fees. You wanna make sure you do the calculation to make sure it's worth your while. They come with a timeline that you get like interest free only for a certain amount. If you can't make that, if you can't pay that off in that amount of time, then you're going to get, you know, slammed with all of this um, interest at, afterwards. Um, and you want to make sure that you're not using that card because all your payments are going to go to that interest free nut. And all of the purchases you're making are going to be at that, what is it, at these points, it's probably 24% interest. So if you're going to do a balance transfer to a credit card, put that credit card away and don't use it again. Um, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau has a lot of good workshops and resources on this. So if you want to do some workshops and do some more reading on this concept, that's a good place to go. Um, I think I've mentioned all of these different actors, but I, it's probably a good idea to define them. You know, obviously your lender is your creditor, the person who actually owns the debt. Now, the creditor is exempt from the Federal Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Creditors are not exempt from the Maryland Debt Collection Law. Debt collectors are people that your creditor hires to. Um, call you and to collect, try to collect on outstanding debt. And a debt collector um, can be hired by the creditor or by a debt buyer. And I'll talk about a debt buyer in a minute. In Maryland, your debt collector has to be licensed by the state. And so this is important. So if you do get a call from a debt collector, uh, you can go to the Commissioner on Financial Regulation, make sure that their uh, company is licensed. 
Now, who are debt buyers? Debt buyers are exactly what the name sounds like. They buy the debt. And now it's them and the Supreme Court has recently held that once a debt buyer buys the debt, they are now standing in the shoes of the creditor, which means they are exempt from the Federal Fair, um, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, unfortunately. But to give you a sense of how much money debt buyers are making, um, in 2016, Encore bought $9.8 billion dollars in debt for 900 million dollars and so they bought at nine cents and recovered at almost 23 cents and so this is why debt buying is so lucrative and why there's still room for debt buyers to hire debt collectors to collect on the debt that the original creditor couldn't <clears throat> now you're in debt collection um what can a debt collector do what can't they do? What can you do now that you're being called hounded by debt collectors? Um, they can't call you before eight or after nine. They can't call you at work if you tell them you are not allowed to get calls at work. They can't discuss your debt with anyone. Your debt is private. Um, they can discuss it with you, with your spouse, or your attorney if you identify one. They can't threaten you with arrest or harm or to take or seize your property, except for repos, obviously. Um, they can't use bad language. They can't lie to you. They can't harass you. Um, and they can't try to collect on any interest or fees that the underlying agreement doesn't allow. So if you are getting a credit card, you always want to hold on to that terms of service because if you are down the road and they're trying to collect on some fee, that's not in that agreement, you can say, aha, you can't collect on this. Um, and so there, these are some of the things they can't do. So what can they do? They can contact other people to see if they can find you without telling them who they are or why they're calling. Um, but they can't call them more than once. Um, if you're sued and there's a court order for garnishment, um, they can go to your bank account or to your employer and try to garnish your wages or garnish your bank account. Um, they are allowed to use robocalls if you've consented. And trust me, in the fine print, you have consented. Um, it's probably somewhere on the 40th page of that terms of service. So what should you get when the uh, debt collector calls you? You need to get the name of the debt collector, name, address, and phone number. Um, it could be the company name. They might give you an operator number. They might give you a first name only. That's fine. You want some kind of identifying information. You want a validation notice, um, the amount of the debt. You want them to mail you what they claim the debt to be. Be aware there's this thing called overbiffing, which is the silliest word I've ever heard, but basically that's them stuffing on um, fees and costs and like attorney's fees, things like that, that isn't allowed by the contract. And the validation notice has to identify the original creditor. Here's the one thing um, that you should know. Sometimes by the time it gets to the debt buyer, that you're dealing with, your debt has been sold so many times, there may be no record of who the original creditor was. So you wanna make sure that you're pushing for that information because if they can't prove or show who the original creditor was, they may not be able to collect on it. And a lawyer can help you advise you on this. You need to also be provided what the debt is for and when it was incurred. So if they just come to you and say, hey, I've got a debt for, you know, $1,000 and I got it from Encore, you're, and you want to say, well, what is it for? They have to be able to say, oh, this is from your Synchrony account. You bought a couch at Value City Furniture, for example. Um, and you should be able to know whether this is debt that you owe or maybe it was someone else that owed the debt, right? Because there are instances of identity thieves racking up debt in your name, so you should be able to test whether this is your debt. 
ask if they've already parked the debt on your credit report. Sometimes, and they shouldn't do this, <laughs> they put it on your credit report before they ever call you. And so not only are you now fighting to validate the debt that might not be yours, now you gotta know if you gotta go clean it up with your credit reporting agency as well. You can absolutely decline to continue this conversation until you receive and review this validation notice. You can ask them to stop calling you. Here's the trick. You should do this in writing and the CFPB's website has sample letters for it. What I have seen anecdotally is that some creditors are claiming that a condition of them giving you credit was their ability to robocall you and to call you whenever they want. And believe it or not, that argument has worked at at least one court. So do it in writing, it should be fine, but if, if you don't end up um, getting it to stop once you've served a written request by certified mail to stop calling you, then you can either give us a call and we can give you some advice, you can contact the CFPB for some further um, information. Um, so, like I just said, you can, they should send the letter by mail. Um, they should stop contacting you and, um, and if they don't, then they, there are some potential issues, um, as well. And you want to always make sure you keep a copy of the letter and of the certified mail receipt. So you can prove that it went and it was received and who signed for it. Um, the National Association of Consumer Advocates is a great organization of consumer advocates. But more importantly, if you want to watch a lot of consumer oriented videos about debt collection, they have a, a library of videos that you can watch um, on, on your own time. Um, this program is, as you know, being recorded and uh, we will be emailing out the link once it's up on YouTube, if you wanna go back and watch it again and, and re-review some of the things that we've said. But if you want more information, NACA's uh, video library is a great place to go. Dealing with debt buyers. Um, I always like to plug the libraries. I would suggest going to the library and looking up uh, the book, Bad Paper. Um, if you want to understand how debt collection and debt buyers really work, um, it's a very eye-opening and short book. Um, you can probably get it on audiobook as well as, you know, a Kindle or um, hardback if you prefer. But if you're dealing with a debt buyer, and that is someone who calls you like, uh, like Encore is one, for example, or Portfolio or something, uh, some name that you've never heard of, chances are they're probably a debt buyer. You wanna legitimize the debt and that you owe it. So again, who's the original creditor? When did this happen? Do they have any of the original documents? Is it really you? So in the, the CFPB ended up fining portfolio $19 million and gave $8 million, actually $8 million in fines and they gave $19 million back to consumers because portfolio was pursuing debt that it knew was inaccurate, that it knew it didn't have sufficient documentation to support, and that they knew was unenforceable, but they still tried to collect it. And this is really, really key to challenge the information the debt buyer has right at the very first contact, do it in writing and say, I don't want to be contacted until you can verify the debt. I want to see my original contract. I want to see all of the information that a creditor would have. If they're going to be treated as a creditor, they should have the documentation of a creditor. And if you read that paper, you'll realize that a lot of debt buyers end up buying debt on an Excel spreadsheet. So all they have is a bunch of names, contact information and phone numbers. A lot of this, a lot of these debts, when they're changing hands, don't come with the underlying documentation. So if you can challenge it, you may be able to, to uh, get away from it. And then you want to negotiate your settlement in writing. 
because you want to have a clear record of what you owe, what the amount of correct it was, make sure it's not stale because they can't collect debt after a certain number of years. And some of the debt buyers and debt collectors make a uh, livelihood on collecting on debt they know is stale. And they'll do something as they'll try to get you to validate your debt. And they'll say, oh, come on. You're telling me you can't even make one cent payment a month. You can afford one cent, can't you? Well, of course, you're going to say, well, yeah, I could make one cent of a payment a month. And guess what you've done? You have now revalidated your debt and you've gone from having a stale, unenforceable collection to a live, brand new debt that you've now reevaluated. And now they've got another five to seven years to collect on it. So when you're talking to debt collectors, never admit that you can even make a penny of payment because you don't want to accidentally revalidate the debt. Um, but when you are negotiating a settlement, all of the terms should be in writing spelled out. So there's no confusion as to what your rights are, what your responsibilities are, et cetera. If you get sued, respond. Not responding, it leads you to default judgments and that's a world of hurt. If you are sued, what do you do before um, you get to trial, right? First, you have to get the summons. You have to get served by this document. Literally, it will say summons on it. You have to file a notice of intent to defend. And that's the thing that says, I got the summons. I hear you. I'm going to defend. And then you want to get legal advice. You can go, the district court has self help. There are attorneys that are there to help you represent yourself. They won't go to court for you, but they will give you advice on what to do. Um, legal Aid, Maryland Volunteer Lawyer Service, um, you know, Howard County Bar Association, I'm sure it's got a lawyer referral service. So you can get legal advice. You can go to NACA as well. Um, sometimes these lawyers will contact you and ask you to sign something that might look like consent judgment, confess judgment. These are documents that are getting you to admit that you owe the entire debt and in full so that if you don't make the payments, now they've got a judgment without court process, without a judge verifying that this really is your debt and is owed, and now they can go collect on it. And confess judgment clauses are illegal in Maryland. So before you sign anything that a lawyer hands you, you want to make sure you're not giving away your, the kingdom or all of your rights. At trial, the creditor has to prove you owe the debt. The burden isn't on you to say, I don't own it. You just have to say, that's not my debt, or that's not the right amount, or um, that debt is too old. Um, you know, I don't have all the documents. They haven't provided you the necessary documents, Your Honor. Or, hey, this debt was discharged. This is the wrong court. You know, maybe they filed it in Howard County, but the debt and the, you live in Caroline County and the debt was incurred in Cecil County. So. Should it be filed in Howard County? Maybe not. Maybe you want to challenge it as an instance of identity theft. All of these defenses should be put in writing to the court. And now the creditor has to prove that you owe the debt. And that's why that notice of intent to defend is so key. And all of your defenses in writing sets up the burden on the collection uh, process. And so if any of the documents are missing, that's how you can um, evade those kinds of problems. And the book Bad Paper showed that with debt buyers, if the consumer showed up, these lawyers were um, dismissing uh, the lawsuits. And if they didn't show up, they were just getting a default judgment and collecting through garnishment, perhaps when they didn't have the right to. So we've talked a little bit about confessed judgments, and I said they're illegal. They're giving away your rights. Um, if you see one, call another attorney because they need to be the one to advise you on what rights you're giving up if you are 
um, entering into any kind of confessed or consent judgment. Um, because you never want to you never want to waive your defenses if you have any. So the collection lawsuit is over. There's a judgment. Um, you've got 30 days to file an appeal or try to work out a settlement plan. That 30 days is a hard 30 days. 31 days, no. If you're going to appeal because you feel the judge got it wrong, that is a hard deadline. The in a judgment situation, the creditor has the right to take discovery to aid in enforcement. So they have a right to get information on you about where your bank accounts are, where do you work? So they have every right to ask you questions about where your money is so that they can attach it. So if you haven't gotten a lawyer up until this point, you definitely wanna get one involved now because once they start to garnish your bank account, your wages, commissions, Years ago, I had a client that was 100% commission and they started to garnish 100% of his commission. So he was without a single payment. So you want to make sure that you are aware of the different areas that they can garnish your uh, income on. Retirement accounts, um, joint marital accounts, there's some exclusions in the law as to what they cannot garnish. Um, and there's some protections available. So you can withhold $5,000. Like if you're a contractor, you need your tools so that you can have $5,000 of items um, excluded from attachment for work. You can have $6,000 in cash or other property excluded, but you have to make this by motion to the court post judgment. Once you're paid in full, it's your responsibility to seek an order of satisfaction from the court so that they can't accidentally you resell your debt and start this uh, party all over again. Um, note, there may not be protections for um, you know, student loans, taxes, or child support in, in the law. So um, those might be things that you always have to pay. And I can tell you there's absent some kind of uh, forgiveness, student loans will follow you to the, the end of the road. Um, scams, what kind of scams are we seeing out there? Um, student loan scams are huge. Um, there's outfits out there that claim to find the best loans. Um, that's not the case. You can find a lot of um, debt consolidation or debt scout settlement scams. As we've talked about it, a lot of these companies will try to for a upfront fee to help you uh, work out. And obviously, if you had the money up front, you could take care of it and you would need that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I talked about the debt buyers um, who buy on spreadsheets, but what I didn't mention, and if you read bad paper, it'll talk about it, is how these spreadsheets on thumb drives get sold and resold and resold. And sometimes you'll find out that an employee of a debt collector may be less than honest and will download his book of business and sell that to somebody, you know, out of the back of a van. And so you may have an instance where you have two different debt collectors trying to collect on the same debt for different uh, creditors. And so that's a huge issue. You've got outright phone scams, right? So you've got the IRS pretending to call for debts. Um, you might have um, folks calling saying you owe money, uh, to a law firm or, you know, they might ask for a wire or a gift card or these days payment app payments. Um, they might say, hey, you've got a debt and if you don't pay it right away, we're going to arrest you. I've got the sheriff on the phone ready to come to your house. Or they might call you and say, hey, you know, I, I need to verify that this is you for a debt collection. Please give me your social security number. Never give anyone your social security number when they call you. Um, unsolicited on the phone or just don't give it over the phone ever really if you can help it. Um, phantom debt collection is this, like I mentioned, you've got someone calling pretending you have some debt that you don't actually owe and trying to coerce some kind of payment out of you. And so those are, those are some of the main scams that we are seeing out there and so that you should be aware of. Um, 
The student loan scams, I'm going to talk a little bit more about them. Those are going to be not only the kind that says, hey, we can find you student loans, but they might promise immediate loan forgiveness or immediate debt cancellation for a fee, right? Or it's some kind of a student loan program of you know some kind, but they pressure you to make this high upfront fee to get into it. Um, they might ask that you sign some sort of a third party authorization. You should never give a power of attorney to someone you don't know. And a lot of times these are disguised powers of attorney, then they can use do all kinds of things in your name. Um, you should never give your FAFSA pin to anybody. And um, back in the day, we we're getting a lot of COVID and CARES Act scams focused on student loans. Um, so that was something that we were um, hearing a lot about as well. So if you want to hear more about student loan scams, here are some resources in uh, federal and in the state that you can uh, refer to. And then now we come up to the final slide, which is when um, we can have questions. And I turn it over to you, Rosa. Sure. Uh, thanks so much, Tracy. We have a few questions. Um, and one, there are a couple of people asking for the repeating the name of the title of the book, which I plugged into the chat. But in case you all didn't see it, it's Bad Paper Chasing Debt from Wall Street to the Underworld. Yes. And then, Tracy, we've got a bunch of questions asking how folks can get the slides. So maybe you can let us know that. Okay. So, what I am planning on doing is when I send out the link to everybody um, who registered, um, I will either hyperlink the, the slides there, or I will try to hyperlink it to the actual YouTube location. So I'll have to see what I can do to make it you know, easy for people to be able to get access to the slide deck. Great, thank you. So we've got some specific questions here. This is from earlier in the presentation. So what warrants a creditor, credit card merchant to take court action, subpoena for outstanding debt, under five uh, five thousand dollars, as opposed to charging it, charging it off and reporting it to the credit bureaus. Policy, whether they feel like it, I think it's it's really a. I don't think that there's any kind of requirement that says that um, a certain amount is not um, sellable versus charge. You have to charge it off instead. Um, I think every creditor uh, makes their own decision. And keep in mind, you have very large creditors who are dealing with mortgages, and you have some smaller creditors out there that maybe the the most you ever had in um, in a loan with them, like an installment loan, maybe it had been a thousand dollars. So it it really is, I think, a decision, it's a business decision that they make. Um, I don't know of any requirements on them. When they're making those decisions. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, next question: How old is too old for a creditor to collect on a state debt or stale debt? Sorry. So that's a question of state law, and I believe Maryland stale debt is seven years. Um, I'll have to verify that, but I believe it's seven years. In some states, it's less. Some states, it's more. Um, but that that is when you have to be really, really careful not to validate the debt by agreeing to even make a single penny payment on it because um, there is definitely a cottage industry of getting that to happen and and uh, it's called zombie debt. You're bringing it back to life. Okay. Another question: How do you know a lawsuit is valid? So there, there's not, uh, there's no way to know, right? So you can file a lawsuit and, you know, people, it just requires a filing fee, right? And the CFPB actually went after this law firm, um, Hannah, I believe it was called, and they were in Georgia, I want to say. They had filed um, hundreds of thousands of lawsuits across the country. They had a battery of local attorneys uh, filing for them. And they determined that there was no way that Hannah could have kept 
any kind of oversight or had sufficient hours in a day to be able to validate the work that went into it. So they were just filing. And remember, I said, if you read bad paper, you'll realize that if you showed up, Hannah was dismissing it. If you didn't show up, they got a judgment. And for them, it was a numbers game, right? And so the CFPB went after them hard and uh, basically shut down that operation. But they can file. It's up to you to challenge it, and then they have to prove it's valid. Okay. Another question, can the SBA collect if the debt is old? So the SBA, um, that's a good one. I think that they, they might be part of those that are exempt, like taxes and student loans, but I don't know for certain. Um, if whoever asks wants to get in touch with us this week, I'll try to get an answer for you um, offline. Okay, someone has mentioned I'm new building credit. Can you recommend any card or loan um, to create good credit? Sure. So I can tell you what I told my son to do, which is get a store card. Um, I think I suggested he try to apply for an Amazon card um, or a gas card, uh, Macy's, you know, just a very simple um, low credit card. Um, now, if you want and this is something you can obviously discuss with a relative if you can't get credit on your own you can ask them to co-sign but keep in mind that if you don't make good on the debt they are going to be responsible so this is a this is a relationship of trust and so both parties have to go into that knowing that but once you establish the credit you can then disengage but you should try to establish it on your own um, avoid secured credit cards, and I didn't want to get into a huge conversation about those. Those are a totally different beast. Those are the ones where you put $500 on a credit card, and you're using your own money to show that you can be good. And as you make payments, uh, as you use it, you put money back in. It's sort of you're using your own money, so it really shouldn't be credit. But somehow, as a end last resort, it actually this one type of card does build you credit. It's so expensive. The amount of fees out of that five hundred dollars, you may only have access to three hundred by the time all the fees are out. So don't go to secured cards unless you don't have any other choice but to use a secured credit card. All right. Another question here: If my credit card is maxed, can I fix it by getting another credit card? You can't fix the max card, and if you're maxed, your credit score, if that's the only card you have, your credit ratio now, your credit to debt ratio now is 100%. So that's causing damage to your credit score, and it may cause problems with your ability to get other credit. Um, so you can try to get additional credit. Chances are it'll be at a higher interest rate. It'll be a lower credit limit. Um, and then, you know, if you run that up, then you're, you're just basically, it's, it's, it's a snowball running downhill at that point, right? So, yes, in theory, you can get more credit, but that obviously isn't going to fix the maxed out credit card that you already have. Okay, so I'm going to scan the chat here to make sure that I didn't miss anything. So, if anyone has any last questions they want to plug in here. Before we finish up, uh, I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Oh, here's one. Uh, how do you know if the lawsuit was filed? Who can I call? Um, I asked because I received a call like this recently filed against me. Is it valid? Okay. Uh, needless, yeah. So, yeah. So, if you go into Google or Bing or whatever, DuckDuckGo, if you prefer complete privacy, um, do a search, uh, do a search for judicial case search. And that is the Maryland docket. It's all available online. Search for your name. If the lawsuit is on file, it'll be there. Now you should have been served. So a process server, some certified mail, some kind of official service of that summons. Remember I mentioned summons. You have to get served with the complaint. So it'll be a summons behind it. It'll be a complaint. It'll be, 
you know, uh, Acme creditor versus John Smith, and we'll talk about all the debt that is allegedly owed, et cetera. You have to be served. Um, be aware that sometimes shady um, collectors may not even try to serve you, but they'll go to court and swear up one side and down the other that their process server can't get you because you're evading service. I have seen this personally. Um, so you always, if you're getting a call and they're saying, I have sued you, they should have served you. So check judicial case search, see if it's even there. Um, it may be that they're trying to um, engage in some kind of negotiation before they file. That's fine. Um, just make sure they're not lying to you that I've already sued you, right? Because remember, debt collectors can't lie to you. So if if you don't want to have a docket in, in your name, having been you know sued for a lien or a collections, and they're giving you a chance to do it before the lawsuit is filed, you can enter into negotiations at that point. Okay, thanks for that. I don't see any further questions. Oh, let's see. Okay, best way to improve my credit for a car loan. Uh, in other words, what do they specifically look for? Debt ratio, late payments. Uh, what is what is going? Yeah, you know, what are they going to look for? I guess. Well, the credit score is obviously. The, the main thing, and I think I mentioned early on that depending on the type of creditor, there's a different algorithm that both Vantage and FICO and other brands use. It's all proprietary. We don't know exactly what goes into it, but the, the higher your credit score, the better your chances of getting a good loan. Um, if, and I'm doing a program later in June about, you know, auto financing, but uh, just to give you a little snippet of that, you know, if you can get into a credit union, go there, your bank may have better rates than a dealership does, but, you know, all the things we've talked about and how to improve your credit. So pull your credit report now, clean up anything that's there. If there's anything that's wrong, challenge it, get it off your credit report. Make sure you're making at least minimum payments, if not more. Improve your debt to credit ratio so that you have more credit than debt um, pending on your accounts. So these are all little things that you can do. And, you know, if, if closing unused cards doesn't detrimentally impact your debt and credit ratio, go ahead and you can close those out. Um, but if they're just sitting in a, in a drawer in your, in your home and no one's using it, it's not really doing any real damage anyway. So the, all the little things, the little things we've talked about can help improve your credit. Um, and so that might be some things you want to start on, but. If you have, if anyone on this program has, you know, questions that, you know, that come to them later, our contact information is here. Give us a call, email us, stop on by, um, you know, we're there five days a week and we're here to help. We're here for you. All right. Um, we have a couple of quick questions, Tracy, and then I guess sure. we can close it out. Okay. Um, so we have, I want to buy a house. My debt to income ratio is high. What's the best route to get a decent loan amount within a short time? Well, obviously to bring the debt down. And so you can talk to cash campaign or CC CSMD about whether uh, debt consolidation or some kind of settlement might be a good way of trying to bring your debt down quickly to help with your credit score. If you have a lender that you trust, you can have a frank conversation with the lender. They're really great, um, especially if you're dealing with a, a broker. Um, maybe they are a good person to go to if you trust them to say, look, you got my credit report. Here's my credit score. What do you see that I could quickly, um, you know, fix that might help in, in this calculation? So talk to a trusted professional about your very specific mix of facts and trade lines and accounts and see what can help you. Okay. And then we've got a comment here uh, asking about the benefits of a credit union, having an old account that I was going to close, but I guess wants to get some more information about credit unions. You know, anecdotally, credit unions have always um, seemed to have better interest rates, especially for auto loans. 
Um, so, and not everyone, you know, if you can get into a credit union and you're thinking that you want a loan, you always want to shop it around. So whether you're shop, whether it's an auto loan, if you're buying a house, you, whatever it is, you always want to shop for the loan. Like you would shop for a car, like you would shop for a house. That loan is almost as important as the thing you're buying. So shop it around, get the best deal and, and make sure that you are, um, giving as much attention to the money side of the acquisition um, as to the thing that you're actually acquiring, I would say. Okay. I think that's the end of the questions in the chat. I will give a few seconds here to see if anyone wants to load in anything else. And uh, as Tracy said, we've got the uh, contact information sitting up here on this slide. If you want to jot that down, but we're also, we'll get the, um, the uh, PowerPoint to you soon. All right, Tracy, I think we're done with the questions. So I'll turn it back right. to you to close us out. All right, and I will stop sharing. Um, thanks everyone for uh, hanging in. It was a very, very dense program. And, um, and I'm sure um, if you have questions, like I said, feel free to reach out to us and uh, feel free to watch the video again, go to NACA, watch their videos. And uh, go to the library, get that paper. You won't regret it. Um, you'll never ever believe how a machete is used in debt collection at a barber shop until you read this book. I can't recommend it enough. But um, thank you. And um, we're going to end the recording and uh, I'm turning it over to our IT staff. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night.